Good afternoon, everyone. Wait, I have to find my, my Bethany here. I'm on page two. You're on page one, Bethany. Hi. Um, okay. So glad to see everyone here. I hope that this is going to be informative. Actually, I know this is going to be informative. And uh, we have Bethany Malosh here, and I'm so excited to do the Zoom meeting with Bethany. First and foremost, she's a really, really good friend of mine. I was actually the maid of honor or the matron of honor in her wedding. What is that, five years ago now? Yep. Oh, geez. And then after that, she got sick of me and she decided to move to London with her husband. And I kind of get that. And I haven't seen her in a while, but um, we used to, I go by her old apartment quite often and miss those times with you, Bethany. But I'm glad that um, we're able to Zoom and we're able to have you. So Bethany is an author. She is a writer. She is a speaker. Something just happened to my Zoom thing. Oh, Berta is sharing their screen. So we are going to stop that sharing, Berta. Okay. There we go. So Bethany um, has a YouTube channel. And if you haven't read her book, I never understand these cameras. Here we go. How Should a Body Be? It's such a good book about growing up with CMT, body image, um, love, death, CMT. I'll, it's just an extraordinary book. And I've read the book several times and you laugh, you cry, you laugh, you cry, and it makes you think. So get that book. There, that's my uh, order for the day. Get the book. But Bethany, welcome. And you're also a member of our advisory board. And there's another person sharing their screen. Yep. I think there we go. Okay. I'm accidentally hitting those buttons. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. You know, those little things. It's funny. We've done quite a few Zoom meetings. This never happened. <laughs> well, it's those CMT finger misclicks, right? That's there right. you go. And we get it. We get it. We'll just go with it. Mm -hmm. So Bethany and I are representatives of the CMT. We are not medical professionals. I'm not a doctor. Sometimes I think I am, but I'm not. And uh, Bethany isn't either. But we either live with the disease or we actually both, my son has CMT and Bethany has CMT. We've been involved for a very, very long time and have worked very closely with the professionals. We will not have the answers to all your questions. And if we don't, we will get the answers. We may have the answers, but if we're not sure, we're not going to give you a fake answer. We're going to go find out what the answer is. But we do have a lot of information to share with you today. And a lot of this is from personal experience. So Bethany, before we get started, I just want to know how you're doing. I didn't tell you I was going to ask this question, but just how are you doing in this time of COVID um, in London and how have the last five months been for you? Uh I mean, to be honest, they've been really difficult. Uh, I think, uh, if anything, this, uh, this situation we're in has sort of reminded me of how vulnerable I am compared maybe to, like, the, the average person. <laughs> um, so I've, I think I've been, like, being confronted with my control issues <laughs> and the fact that, you know, ultimately I have this disease that I can't control. And I don't like that very much. Um, but it was such great timing for you to ask me to participate in this because knowledge and education about CMT makes me feel like I have some of that control back. And I need that especially right now. And I'm, I'm sure many of us do. That's right. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. It's, it has been a tough time for, for everybody. And um, just really glad to see you today. So why don't we start off by you telling us about a little bit about CMT, what you thought you knew and what you know. Yeah, well, I was diagnosed about 16 years ago when I was 12. And I think I've spent the last 16 years unlearning everything I originally learned about this disease. And realizing that most of the things I thought I knew about CMT are either just wrong or incomplete knowledge, right? Misleading. 
Uh, one of the first things I was told about CMT um, by the doctor who diagnosed me, uh, he sat down with me and, and my parents and, you know, their newly diagnosed daughter. And he said, oh, well, CMT gets worse every generation. So your daughter's going to be worse than you, he said to my dad. And in fact, your daughter should really consider if she should ever have children. Right? He said that the day a 12-year-old was diagnosed. And... I mean, first, like, how irresponsible. <laughs> but also now I know that that hasn't even been proven to be true, that CMT gets worse with every generation. We don't know that that's true. Um, and since then, I have just been met with so many examples of things that, that aren't true. Um, I think even if we look at the very basics of the disease, a lot of us think of CMT as being one disease. There's a disease called CMT. When in reality, CMT is really hundreds of different disorders caused by hundreds of different genetic mutations that cause peripheral neuropathy. And we just give them the same name to categorize them because that makes sense because they look pretty similar. But it's really important to remember that a lot of us on this call actually have different types of CMT. They're separate conditions. And it's something really important to remember if we're comparing symptoms uh, because they can present in different ways. And even, you know, I think, I mean, again, when I was diagnosed, I was told this is an arm and a leg disease. That's not true. That's not true, Bethany. It's misleading. <laughs> <laughs> it's misleading because, yes, of course, it's an arm and a leg disease in the sense that that's where CMT tends to show up first, right? We know that it tends to affect the longest nerves in the body first. So we often, you know, see the symptoms in our feet, maybe in our fingertips. But CMT affects all of the peripheral nerves in our body. And it can show up in other places than just your arms and your legs. Like? Well, I think it's affected basically every part of my body, <laughs> uh, which is why I feel like really personally victimized <laughs> uh, by this narrative. Um, it's affected my hips. It's affected my core. It's affected my diaphragm. It's affected my hearing. Um, I know that I'm a little bit unusual. I have a fairly severe case, uh, but I think it's really important for us to realize that it can affect more than the arms and the legs, so we can look out for those symptoms and we can get treatments if needed. That's really great. And Bethany, you have CMT1A, right? I do. Right. And so in the past, when we first started out 20 years ago, we're like, oh, uh, CMT1A people with 1A never have breathing issues or people with CMT don't have breathing issues, which we have found is inaccurate and, and not true, right? We're not sure of the prevalence, but it's not as uncommon or rare as once we once thought, right? Yeah. No, and I looked it up. I read, oh, 1A is the mild type. <sighs> so I was like, oh, then great. I'll be fine. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, 1A runs in my family. I've got several generations of CMT1A, and it's affected all of us a little differently. You know, you said something to me the other day, and you said uh, you were going through your generations um, previous to you, and everyone had breathing issues in your family line with CMT1A. Yeah, which is... Um, it's interesting. I recently had a doctor ask me, because I've been having a lot of breathing issues with my CMT, and, and they asked, well, what about your, your family history? Did anyone else in the family have breathing issues with their CMT? And I'd never been asked that question before. And then I thought about it. I'm like, okay, yeah, my, my dad has breathing issues, and my grandma had breathing issues, and I know my great-grandfather had breathing issues. <laughs> um, maybe there's something here. And, you know, the CMTA is doing so much great research on these other types of mutations and modifiers that maybe run in families and make you more likely to have an additional symptom with whatever type of CMT you have. Right. Thank you. 
interesting. So, you know, I get a lot of questions um, about CMT and we, on our Facebook discussion group, the um, Shark Memory Tooth Association discussion group on Facebook. And uh, they say, is CMT an autoimmune disease? What do y'all think? Just shake your head yes or no. No, it is not an autoimmune disease. It is not, it's not, it's not. An autoimmune disease is it mistakenly attacks the body's immune system. It's not that. It's not an autoimmune, but you know, we can say what it's not. What is it not? It's not, okay, here's a big one. Don't yell at me, okay? It's not muscular dystrophy, okay? It is not muscular dystrophy. I was thinking, uh, Kenny Raymond is our part of our discussion group, and I was thinking about it the other day, and it really hit home. CMT is not muscular dystrophy, and it's not multiple sclerosis. It's sort of like saying, if you said, oh, it's, and you know what I think people know that? Muscular dystrophy is a disease of the muscles themselves, okay? CMT is a nerve disease. It affects the nerve, right? It affects the peripheral nerves. MS affects the spinal cord and brain. So if I said it's sort of like MS, it's not really like MS at all. It is not MS. It's sort of like muscular dystrophy. No, it isn't. Muscular dystrophy, yeah, your muscles become weak and atrophy. They, they lose their muscle tone and strength, but it's not muscular dystrophy. It's a nerve disease. So the nerves lose their strength and the muscles are affected in atrophy. So it's three distinct diseases. And I think a lot of problems come up because you don't know how to explain CMT. How do you explain CMT? Okay, so this is what I do, and I don't say that I have the answer for everything, okay? Because there's so many ways. So I say, okay, first of all, I say CMT is a genetic disease. It's caused by gene mutations. Then I say, it's not country music TV, CMT. <laughs> so that, that they just get the CMT acronym in their brain. So people will remember it and go home and look at it. I don't think CMT is funny, but that is the way I explain it to people. So they'll remember people that, people, if you say Sharko Marie Tooth, all they hear is teeth. And they go, oh, I'm trying to look up that tooth disease and I can't find it. And then I say, it's a disease of the peripheral nerves and it's slowly progressive. And that's how I started off. And then we can go in a little, and I try to keep it easy. But if you say it's sort of like muscular dystrophy, it's not. And you know, you could do that, but it's not giving our disease justice and spreading awareness, in my opinion, this is only my opinion, is really, really important so that more and more people understand what CMT is. And if you don't use the term, no one's going to know. And we're just, oh, okay. And so there's somebody that had something to, to add. Bethany, what do you say when uh, people say, what is CMT? What is CMT? Yeah, it depends on my mood. <laughs> Uh, I think people can take in limited scientific information at a time. I mean, we hear these terms all the time, but if you tell someone, oh, I have, you know, a progressive demyelinating peripheral neuropathy, like they've lost you at demyelinating. Um, so I, you know, if someone's like, oh, why are you, why are you walking that way? I will usually say I have nerve damage in my legs which most people like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense to them. And then usually there's a follow-up question like, oh, how did that happen? Were you in a car accident or, you know, or something? I love it when people guess because sometimes their guesses are really absurd. Um, and then I say, no, I actually have a genetic condition that causes nerve damage over time. Um, and it, you know, it starts in my arms and my legs. And I find most people are able to, to handle that. And, and then we can sort of start talking about the name. And, uh, and often they really make a, a note to look that up later, which is, which is always nice to raise a little awareness. I like that. You say, so I have nerve damage. What did you say? Can you repeat that? How you explain it? Yeah, I have nerve damage in my legs. If they're and asking about my legs, right? Or, or if I'm asking them, hey, can you, 
open something for me and say, right. oh, I have nerve damage in my hands, you know, and, and then we can expand from there. But what um, is the second thing you said? I have nerve damage in my, in my legs, in my hands. And how did you relate your muscles to that? Um, I don't necessarily relate the muscles, but, um, I mean, I, I would say that, uh, once the nerves are damaged, they're not able to talk to the muscles anymore. And when the muscles get ignored, they get really sad and they shrink. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Isn't that great? So I encourage you all to talk about CMT, find easy ways to talk about CMT. And you know, you don't always want to talk about it and that's fine too. But let's give this disease the, you know, a name and a description that it deserves so that we can spread awareness, embrace the disease and get a cure. I mean, it, it's all about public awareness and spreading the word and really owning it. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I, I can add on to that is, um, there's also a really practical reason we maybe don't want to think of it as muscular dystrophy, which is most of our muscles work fine. And, um, you know, uh, one of the, I think, most damaging myths that I hear in the community is that you can't build muscle. Um, and this is another one that I think is, is sort of nuanced. And, and there's some truth in it. And, and then there's also not. Uh, there are absolutely some muscles in my body that the nerves that are supposed to be talking to them stop talking to them a long time ago. And those nerves, they're just done. <laughs> like, like they're, they're never going to talk to that muscle again. Uh, and those muscles, like I'm especially talking about the ones in my calves, I'm not going to be able to build back up. However, there's a lot of muscles in my body, like, you know, in my upper arms, uh, my quads, muscles in my hips, that are still getting some nerve connection. And I actually can build those up and can strengthen them. And I have, I've been lifting just these tiny little baby weights and now I have little tiny cute bicep bumps. <laughs> um, so that's why, you know, we wanna, we wanna be really clear that the issue isn't the muscles. The issue isn't the muscles, the issue is the nerves. And if there's that nerve connection there, um, there's still hope for us to build back up some of those muscles, which can be really life-changing. That's right. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, did you want to talk about, oh, so the other one, last thing I want to say before I give the floor to you, Bethany, is that um, a lot of people think, some, I've heard so many horror stories, and I'm sorry if you've heard these stories, but can you predict the progression of the severity of progression in CMT. So you go to the doctors and I've heard people say, I went when I was 18, they say, you'll be in a wheelchair by 30. You'll be in a wheelchair by so such and such. You're never gonna be able to walk. That is not, you can't predict the, the progression of the disease. One thing we know, it progresses. We cannot predict progression. Even if you have, a, you're not going to progress probably most likely the same as your, your children or your parents or your siblings. We just don't know. Anything to add? It's kind of abrupt. We just don't know how it's going to progress. Uh, I have a question. Um, my name is Fred Masman. Uh, I'm joining from overseas in Sweden. Uh, glad to be joining. Uh, I was wondering about uh, infections and uh, the onset of symptoms and, and what can actually pro progress the disease. Uh, and and uh, what, what, is there any research or so and such on that subject? Uh, because what I heard that, that it could be a, 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 this some kind of, of uh, a trigger the onset of symptoms so you know I don't think we have that information the one thing we know that can make CMT progress are, are cancer medications like vincristin 
So a lot of those um, using chemotherapy and um, will make it will make everybody's nerves have some sort of neuropathy. So if you have CMT, it's bound to make it worse or it could. But there are very few studies, even with vincristin. We have some case studies. We know we guard against it. But I think there is um, a lot of research that's lacking to know what triggers. I've heard that people say that stress has made my CMT worse. Infections have made my CMT. And I don't think we have the research to back it up. But honestly, I think if, if you feel that you're, you're worse because of such and such, take that into consideration. And you may not be able to get a... Uh, an answer, a, a concrete answer, because I just don't think people know. Bethany, what do you think? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. And um, I mean, this is like purely speculation. I'm, I'm guessing that there are certain things that will make CMT worse, <laughs> right? I mean, the body, everything is so interconnected. <laughs> um, we do know, sometimes I'll hear people say, oh, I got CMT from an infection. We know that's not true. If you have CMT, you've had it since you were conceived. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly an area of, of research that we really need, need more of. We know so much, yet so little, right? It's, it's like this in, in so many fields of medicine. Bethany, so you have the mild type of CMT, right? That's what I was told. <laughs> that's what I was told. No, um, yeah, no, I have 1A. Um, I have a fairly severe case, I guess. Um, whereas, you know, so I had surgeries when I was 18. I was in a wheelchair, could not stand up at all without um, leg braces, walked with severe pain. Um, I was incredibly lucky that my surgeries got me out of the wheelchair. Um, I can now take a shower again, which is just wonderful. Uh, but I also have a lot of other impacts. In, in the last few years, I've really noticed a huge uh, changes in my breathing. Um, and I was actually diagnosed with restrictive lung disease caused by my CMT. And that was really annoying because no one told me that that could happen. Um, and... Uh, that's why I've, I've really started making videos, doing things like this with the CMTA, because even if some of these complications are rare, they can happen, right? I was told a while ago, you don't see breathing issues in CMT1A, and yet here I am. And I wish I had known that that was a possibility, because there are treatments and interventions that we can do to improve your quality of life. Do you want to expound on that a little bit or wait till yeah, the... what are they? Yeah, for the breathing specifically. Yeah, why don't you yeah. talk to us a little bit about the breathing? Yeah, so I have um wow, there's there's so many issues with breathing. <laughs> One thing that we we do know is that there's a much higher incidence of sleep apnea with people with CMT. And actually, a lot of just the general public have sleep apnea, um, especially in, in America. Uh, but we see a much higher incidence with CMT. Um, and in my case, because my diaphragm is affected, I breathe shallower. Okay? And especially if I'm laying down in bed, I'm taking very shallow little breaths. And this is called hypoventilation. And this can, can do a lot of things. It can cause you to wake up quite frequently because your brain is like, what on earth? She's not breathing, right? Wake her up so that she gets a nice big deep breath of air. So I was waking up feeling very unrested. It can also lead to you accumulating CO2, right? You're, you're not getting, yeah, you're not breathing out the CMT, the CO2 effectively enough. So I was waking up in the mornings and I was feeling really foggy. Mm -hmm. Like my head, I felt, I felt stupid. I was struggling to do my job and I didn't know why. Um, 
And for many people with CMT who have these issues, a BiPAP machine solves them. They just need a little bit of assistance during the night and that will uh, give them the quality of sleep that they've been missing for so long. Um, and that's just huge. Uh, in my case, I've been really difficult to ventilate at night. <laughs> um, and that's, that's its whole other issue. But I've actually been put on what's called a cough assist machine. And that does a couple things. Basically, it's, it's a, a mask that I hold to my face. And I, it gives me like forced pressure. So I take deep breaths with the help of the mask. And what this does is it expands my lungs as far as they will go. It fills them with air and it gets that air into all the tiny little lung branches. And that's really important because if you're not able to take a deep breath because of the weakness in your diaphragm and those little lung branches aren't getting filled with air, they actually start dying back and you start losing lung capacity which makes everything worse. <laughs> so this mask helps ventilate my lungs. It helps, you know, get me big, deep breaths of air, which is really helpful for lung health. And then it also will give me a few negative pressure breaths where I cough into the machine really hard and go, <clears throat> <clears throat> and it helps me get a really strong cough. And this is important because Again, if you have diaphragm weakness, your cough is often really weak and you're not able to clean out your lungs. You're not getting out the little debris and dust and things that collect in there and can give you a higher likelihood of getting an infection. And we really just want to avoid getting infections if we already have lung weakness. So why is your diaphragm weak? Because the diaphragm is a muscle, right? Muscular... Is it the phrenic nerve that, that gives, um, lets the diaphragm work? Yeah, yeah, the, the phrenic nerve can be affected and that can cause the diaphragm weakness. Right, so it has to do with, it goes back to the nerves. The nerves are affected, so the muscles are affected. Exactly, and, and there can be other, you know, muscles even in the neck that can be affected. I mean, breathing is a really complicated system and we've got a, a lot of nerves involved. <laughs> And, and things can go awry. Well, okay, well, thank you for that. Um, and we, we can um, entertain some questions afterwards about breathing and CMT. So did you wanna talk about surgery a little bit, Bethany? Like, is it amazing? Is it not the thing to do? What do you do? Yeah, and that's, that's another sort of nuanced thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll hear people say, oh, surgery is horrible. You should only do surgery as a last resort surgery leaves people in more pain and then i hear other people say like oh surgery is the best don't do bracing just get surgery and it will solve your problems and of course it's it's a much grayer area uh, i had an amazing experience with surgery surgery took away almost all of the pain i was experiencing surgery has me walking around and that's that's great you know as an 18 year old when i had them that was giving me like my life back uh, but I also know people who've had surgeries, and it's been a horrific experience for them. And they had equally talented and experienced surgeons as I did. Um, so I think it's, there's no easy answer. Yeah, you just don't know. I mean, it's a risk. I mean, they can do the same procedures and have something not work out. And for somebody else, work out, your feet are beautiful. They came out beautifully. Thanks. You know, they really, really did. And my son, Johan, had, had a lot of issues. Uh-oh, he's on, he's on here. Sorry for you talking about you again, Johan. But, you know, he, the first one didn't work. He had it done again, and he still has some issues. So you can't, you, we don't look back. We just look forward. But he's like, I'm not having that second foot done. No way. And so there's some drop foot involved. And but Bethany, you wear braces. Now, there's a big, um, you know, a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to wear AFOs, which are braces. I don't want to wear those because they're going to make me weaker. What do you think about those statements? Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that, that braces make you weaker. Uh, 
So I've, I've spoken to, to Sean McHale, who's a really excellent orthotist, um, been on the CMTA's advisory board. And his response to that was that some braces, certain types of braces, can make you weaker. And these are, you know, in particular, those like really restrictive, thick plastic ones uh, that basically just aren't letting you use certain muscles in your lower legs. So of course those muscles are gonna get weaker. Um, that just sort of makes sense. And so he really tries to, to go for the least restrictive option possible that will still give people the function that they need. Um, but I think, I mean, I always like playing devil's advocate with this sort of thing. I think that those braces could also make you stronger because maybe now you're able to leave the house <laughs> right. and you're able to walk more and you're able to do more things. So yeah, maybe my braces make my calves a little bit weaker, but man, my, my quads might be getting stronger. My hips might be getting stronger. My cardiovascular health is probably improving. <laughs> so I would certainly encourage anyone that if, if your function is being limited because you're not wearing braces, don't not investigate it because you've heard they'll make you weaker. I think that would be a real tragedy. That's a great point. So yeah. another thing I'm gonna move on and I wanna make sure we have time for questions is how many times, and I, I fought this battle, somebody says CMT does not cause pain. Mm -hmm. How many people believe that? Raise your hand. All right, okay, CMT does cause pain. So it can be, there are several types of pain in CMT and could be musculoskeletal. It could be because you're overusing certain muscles and um, or some are weak, some are stronger. So you might have muscle pain or get tendonitis. You also, because of the way we, the, you, that we walk and that, that, you know, trying to lift your feet up or wearing braces, you can get joint pain. So a lot of people with CMT who have been walking, trying to lift their feet, have knee pain, ankle pain, hip pain, and they have some issues in their back. CMT can also cause kyphosis and scoliosis, which is an S-curve or a rounding of the back, which can then infringe on your breathing and digestion. That can cause pain. And it also can cause nerve pain. And it's, it's funny because you go, oh, it affects the nerves and I have no feeling in my feet, yet my feet are killing me. Or I'm having zaps, nerve pain. Who has those zaps? Or feel like tingling or burning pain. I know this from my son and it's very interesting um, that CMT can cause nerve pain. You know, at first they said, no, that you know, go see, bring him to a psychologist. That's what they told him when I was seven, when he was seven. Bring him to a psychologist because, you know, pain is the way you're, you're mothering him and blah, blah, blah. So no, even his brain, if I go towards his foot, his brain already registers pain and he feels jabbing pain in his foot. And that's just amazing. The brain gets triggered and can cause those pain sensations in your body. It also causes neuropathic pain. And not everyone has neuropathic pain, but that pain that's like, like stabbing and burning and tingly, that's nerve pain. And there are medications for that. But I just want to tell you that CMT does cause pain. And um, your doctors may say it doesn't, but you know yourself that it does, right? And some people- oh, This is the most pain. frustrating thing, because let me show you something. I've been listening to this now. There are 100 participants. These people are talking. If I go back to where I was, my name is on there, but I'm the only one. All right. Uh, Elizabeth, try again. Can you hear me? Who are, you are you talking to me? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just continue on? Yep. Sorry about that. I muted Jean. I think she's struggling with her control panel. Okay. All right. That's great. And we'll take some questions at the end. And if not, you can send in your questions. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I wanted to 
um, explain is, did you know that, and when you think about it, it's quite fascinating, anybody in the world can get CMT, can be born with CMT. So CMT is, is a heritable or inherited disease. That means it has the possibility of being an inherited from a parent. Um, however, spontaneous mutations happen all the time. So we did not have CMT in our family. And there's not somebody that's like more predisposed or not. I'm not even sure why genetic mutations happen. They happen all the time. But my son with no history ever, ever, ever in CMT anywhere in our generations has CMT. So people are born with CMT every day and not even knowing it. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a, it's a fun fact. It's not really fun, but it's fun. And there's another one um, that people think that wonder, they ask us if, if I have CMT1A or if I have CMT2A, can I give my child a different type of CMT? And the answer is no, you pass on your own CMT to your children or your child. And it depends on the type of CMT. Some have a 50-50 chance of being passed on. Other have like X-linked different hereditary patterns. CMT4 is a recessive. So one gene from the mom, one gene from the dad come together and the child may get CMT, but it will be the same type of CMT. Okay. The other question that I get is, can I have two types of CMT? Possible, definitely possible. You might get CMT from your mom or your dad and then have a genetic mutation. Or there are many other possibilities. But many people think that when they get some, the, the confusion comes in, in my opinion, and Bethany, I'd like your opinion on this after, is genetic testing results. You get it back and it says this gene is mutated, this gene has a mutation, this gene is a mutation, and uh, these are all VUS or variants of unknown significance. What does that mean? It means the mutations that they found, even though it might have something to do with a gene that causes CMT, this variant of unknown significance means that it's not necessarily CMT related. There's not enough information. They don't know why this gene has mutated and what disease it's causing, if any. So people look, obviously those genetic reports are written, so you like no one can understand them, right? <clears throat> but if you look at them and it says VUS, that just means that you do have a genetic mutation, but we don't know if it has anything to do with CMT or not. And just because you have a negative DNA test. It does not mean that you, wait, it means you, you still may have CMT. It's just that there are blood tests and saliva tests. There are not enough of them for all the types of CMT there are. And there are many more types of CMT that we don't even know about yet. There are over a hundred types of CMT out there and more and more as we go on, and they're discovering more and more, but there aren't blood tests to tell you, oh, it's this one, it's that one, it's this one. That will evolve over time. So when I first started the CMT, we knew 20 years ago, we only knew 20 types of CMT that could be tested through DNA testing. Now there are many, many, many more, but not one lab test for all the different subtypes of CMT, which further complicates things. So the best thing to do is talk to your neurologist and see a genetic counselor. And there's an association called the National Society of Genetic Counselor, NSGC.org. And you can find a genetic counselor in your area to go over that test because it's not, it's, it's, they're hard to understand. They're, they're complicated. Bethany, did I forget anything? No, I, I think those are great points. Genetics is are really confusing. Right. Um, this is kind of just an aside, but we know I have CMT1A. It's like genetically confirmed multiple times. And they keep testing me to see if I have other types. They're literally, the, the neurologists here are like, oh, let's just run another panel and see if you have another type. Uh, because they don't believe that 1A could cause, you know, the symptoms I've had, which, man, nothing makes you feel 
more screwed up. <laughs> and then be like, you must have something else because you're just an overachiever. Um, Which you are, but you know, you don't want to be one in this, this spectrum, right? In the CMT world. No. So what do you say, Bethany, to people who say, oh, only the women in our generations in our family history get CMT? Or only the men. It's only the men. What are they talking about? Oh, yeah. You know, I've, I have seen that a lot. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not doubting that. I'm not doubting that one bit. Right. Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> Humans are really good it looking for and finding patterns. Just like that is an innate biological thing we do. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we also then tend to try to like ascribe meaning to those patterns. So we might look at our, you know, three generations that we know of with CMT and be like, oh, it's all women. So that <laughs> must mean that only women in our family can get CMT. And that's a dangerous assumption to make uh, because to my knowledge, we don't know of any type of CMT that only women can get. Uh, so I would be really careful <laughs> making assumptions based on patterns you've, you've rightfully noticed in your family tree. Um, and if you have questions, go see a genetic counselor because this is literally what they do all day, every day. And they can in depth look at your family tree with you look at your genetic results and interpret that um, and hopefully give you some, some good insights. Thank you. And the, the last thing I'd, I'd like to say is that um, how many people have hearing issues they think are CMT related? Yes. Okay. So CMT can definitely affect hearing and it's really, it's the inner ear detects sound successfully. Uh -huh. So the inner ear detects sound successfully but where the problem is the cochlear nerve can be affected. So the problem is sending sound from the ear to the brain. So when the cochlear nerve is affected, that's when you have problems. And that manifests in like, if you're in, it's hard to distinguish sounds, especially when there's ambient noise or you're at a party, it's hard to understand what people are saying because of this. So also people are very hard of hearing as they get older. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish what's CMT related and what's not, but there are tests there. Hearing aids can help, but just to let you know, when the cochlear nerve is affected, you can have problems with hearing. And Bethany, you told me recently that you had some hearing problems and I didn't know that. What? Did you, <laughs> do you have hearing issues? I do. I'm pretty sure I do. I, I was actually supposed to get a test this year, but that was canceled due to, um, you know, issues happening in the world right now. But I did speak to an audiologist on the phone uh, about it. Um, she works at the CMT Center of Excellence here in London. And, uh, you know, she was describing the, the changes that they see. Um, and she said that the changes will actually start in childhood in the hearing nerve. Um, but the changes are just so mild that they tend not to be recognized um, until much later. Uh, and I was asking her if, uh, because I am such an overachiever with my CMT, I was like, you know, am I special? Like, is this, is this really rare? And she was like, no, you're not special at all. We see tons of CMT patients who have their hearing impacted. Um, and I, she said, what she actually said was, she said, you are the norm rather than the exclusion. And that was really interesting because, I mean, five years ago, I don't remember anyone talking about hearing loss and CMT. Right. And Kenny Raymond, who is on our advisory board and who's on the, he's incognito here on our screen, but he was saying, and I agree, is that you can have a normal hearing test and still have hearing issues and that's understanding what people are saying when there's noise in the background. So it's interesting. So really, um, Kenny, did you want to speak to that for a second? You unmute yourself or 
Laurel. But just the, the hearing issues with CMT are really interesting to me, just with what you had just described. Because, uh, um, and what Bethany had touched on too with the audi audiologist starting to learn a little more is that we could have completely normal hearing tests, but as soon as you put us in a room full of people, we start losing it and we, we lose speech um, primarily. The midtones seem to be more effective than the high tones or the low tones. And they're recognizing that these changes are going all the way back to childhood, but again, they're just so mild and they start so slow because CMT itself tends to be a slow progression over time that by the time it's recognizable, we're in trouble now. And while we can combat hearing loss with hearing aids and whatnot, much like the disease process of CMT, hearing loss in and of itself doesn't ever stop. It just only ever progresses. So it, it adds another interesting component to everything we thought we used to know. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you so much. Kenny is also on our CMTA advisory board, Wealth of Knowledge. Bethany, um, we're getting short of time now, and I did want to take a couple questions. I'm going to ask you a tough question, and it's about your opinion on CMT, fatality, and breathing. Hmm. Do you see a link? What's your experience? Yeah, um, what, a, what a happy note to end yeah, on. Yeah, we're going to end on a very um, <laughs> nice, happy note. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, since I was diagnosed, I've mostly heard, you know, CMT is not fatal. CMT doesn't significantly affect quality of life. Um, and now we're seeing that CMT sometimes can be fatal. It's rare, but if you're in that percentage of the population with CMT that has the severe breathing weakness, that can sometimes lead to complications uh, that could be fatal. And I understand why doctors and honestly just everyone don't really want to talk about that because you don't want to scare people, right? Because it is rare, right? You're you're probably gonna be okay. You know, you're probably gonna need some leg braces maybe, need some physical therapy, but you know, you're unlikely to have, you know, horrifically affected breathing. Uh, but these cases can happen. And I think it's just really, I guess, I guess I'll put it this way. When I was diagnosed with restrictive lung disease, after having been really active in this community, having worked really hard to educate myself about CMT, having seen most of like the experts with CMT, and I got that diagnosis and I was surprised. I felt really let down because I shouldn't have been surprised. Looking back now, there were red flags in me 10 years ago that I wish I had picked up. Because then I could have gotten on maybe a BiPAP machine. I could have gotten on the cough assist machine, which would have likely prevented a few pneumonias. And you really want to prevent a pneumonia because that leads to scar tissue in your lungs, which makes you more likely to get another pneumonia. <laughs> right? So I, I think it's important to, to actually be aware of the worst case scenario just in case, then you're prepared. Because I think the, the most harmful myth that I've heard when it comes to CMT is that there aren't any treatments, right? There's no treatment. And so why even bother getting a diagnosis or why even bother going to a neurologist or why even bother thinking about CMT at all? Because there's no treatment. And yeah, there aren't pills and pharmaceutical treatments beyond pain management, but the CMTA is working on that, which is wonderful. Very excited about that. But there's actually tons of treatments, <laughs> right? From eating better to weight control to physical therapy and exercise to bracing for your hands, for your feet, for your hips, to stretching, 
to surgery, to BiPAP machines, to cough assist machines. There's so many things we can do that can actually have a really meaningful effect on the trajectory of our disease and on our lives. And that's the biggest myth that I really want to combat in this community. Amen. Thank you so much. That's, that's really nice. Laura, we'll th thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Bethany. I really miss you. Oh, I miss you too. I think that was a very positive uh, thing to, to share. You know, it didn't, you thought we were ending on a negative note, but no, I think talking about how, what is available to us with CMT is so incredibly important. So that is such a wonderful and helpful reminder, Bethany. I like that so much. And knowledge is power. And like yeah. you said, knowledge yeah, is power. Absolutely. Laurel, do we have questions that we want to take? We have five minutes, maybe 10 left maximum. So we had a couple questions come in through the chat and a lot of them have been uh, addressed by fellow CMTers, which is always great to see. Um, but what I thought we might do is if you want to raise your hand, you can either raise your physical hand or raise your little Zoom hand. <laughs> and we can come around because we want to be um, respectful of all not talking over each other. So I'm going to come around and look for people. I do have to scroll through the pages to find people with their hands up. And I think I spot Scott Redfield. Do you have your hand up? You'll have to unmute. There you go. Yep. Thank you so much for doing this. This is my first time. But uh, Bethany, you and I had the same birthday because I've had it for 16 years as well. It's been an awful disease. They've had me on a fentanyl patch for eight years. And I've been through the gamut. But water exercise has really helped me wonderfully. But I did have AFib, and I was wondering if AFib could have been caused by that as well. Now, I had the procedure done where they froze three parts of my heart to get rid of the AFib. But I had sleep apnea. I tried the BiPAP machine. I couldn't do it. Felt, I felt like I was suffocating. So I used a CPAP, which is okay. But my oxygen level was down to 80%, which is awful. Yeah. So the other thing is, uh, Scott, a non invasive non-invasive ventilator, NIV. Our um, pulmonologist really uh, encourages people to get an NIV as opposed to a BiPAP and CPAP. So that might be another option. NIV. Yeah, um, the, the BiPAP is actually a type of NIV. But he has a, a, it is a type of NIV, but I think he has something, something different that he was, do you want to explain that? Yeah, so, um, so the CPAP is, is a constant flow of pressure right. uh, during the night for sleep apnea. And that could be a problem for a lot of CMT patients because we have that weakness in the breathing and we actually have trouble breathing out against the air. Yeah. So sometimes C CPAP can actually make our sleep apnea worse. Uh, and you can feel like you're slowly dying, which, you know, is not great. Um, when people say BiPAP, they usually, BiPAP is to NIV like Kleenex is to tissues. BiPAP is actually just a brand name, okay? Um, okay. And NIV slash BiPAP is where you can actually set different pressures. So you might have a stronger pressure for the inhalation when we really need help breathing in, but then you might have no or a weak pressure when you breathe out. And often we'll be put on a BiPAP, but it's actually not BiPAP. It's a, it's a more sophisticated type of NIV like Elizabeth's talking about because they're getting better machines every year. Uh, but yes, if you're on CPAP, maybe just like ask about trying BiPAP slash NIV. Um, as for the heart issues, I have always been told that CMT doesn't affect the heart to our knowledge directly. However, sleep apnea can put a lot of stress on the heart, yeah. right? Again, like the body is really interconnected. So could CMT have indirectly affected your heart? I mean, I would make that, you know, bet that it's a possibility. <laughs> Kenny, I'd like you to weigh in on this because you just had experiences like Scott was talking about. I was I was going to ask if I could weigh in. <laughs> I knew you so, were. You're giving me so, your eye. So it's interesting, Scott, that 
you mentioned AFib because on Monday I had my tonsils out at 47 years old. Uh, but that's a long story in and of itself. But Monday evening, I had my first ever AFib attack, which was awesome. And um, when I finally met with the cardiology team on Tuesday while still in AFib, I actually asked them if they could find or knew of any correlation between CMT and cardiac conduction abnormalities. And specifically, I have 1A. And the cardiologist, um, thank God, um, I have these doctors that I have. The cardiologist had already looked into that question before I asked it. And the doctor said, you know, there's, they found a couple things in their published literature, but it related to a couple different um, gene mutations. Wasn't sure if I had those gene mutations. So the doctor actually showed me in their database what they found. And they found one report which listed um, the gene mutation associated with CMT20. And they found one little mention of um, a gene mutation in RAB7, which is uh, 2C. And that was it. And they were just literally little tiny blips of a mention. So anecdotally in the community, there's a lot of information on cardiac abnormalities and CMT. However, there's no quantifiable data in the published literature. So it's a controversial subject in the very least. But like Benthody just mentioned, if you're dealing with sleep apnea, then there's absolute um, cardiac components that come along with that because any type of a sleep disturbance affects us head to toe and can especially affect the cardiopulmonary system. Excellent. So does CMT cause AFib? There's nothing in published literature that connects it. Mm. Interesting, um, huh? Yeah, but it, if with your sleep disturbances, like Bethany said, please talk to your physician about that. Because if you're on just single pressure CPAP, the yeah. consensus is that in neuromuscular patients across the board, not just CMG, single pressure is the wrong therapy mm -hmm. and for several reasons. And the consensus is airing now on BiPAP with an ABAPS um, capability. The ABAPS is, um, this, hopefully I get this right, automatic, no, average volume assured pressure support, AVAPS. And that's essentially just a fancy bypass that also ensures that you're getting a consistent pressure delivered with every breath while also getting bi-level pressure. So you get the, the higher pressure to keep your airway open to combat the obstructive apnea, but then it drops the pressure down so that you don't have an issue exhaling against the pressure of the mask while also assuring that you're getting um, what your lung tidal volume is with every breath. So that helps the muscles to get a, um, a break in between breaths. Yeah, like Bethany, I have trouble breathing in, so I just can't take the deep breaths anymore. And, and yeah. I feel a lot of singing. So to take a breath is really important when you're singing. So. Uh, Bethany used to sing. Huh? <laughs> you're probably going to kill me now. <laughs> yeah, I, I did used to sing. I'm seeing a, a couple questions about whether swallowing issues and voice impairment can, can be involved in CFT. Yes, both. Swallowing issues and vocal impairment. Um, some people with CFT can have vocal paralysis, vocal cord paralysis. Um, and and one of my vocal cords is apparently a little a little lazy. <laughs> and they I even got they did a little put a tube down my throat and and showed me that oh yeah the left one's a, l a little affected so it's working really hard for you. Um, and, and might make it a little bit hard for you to achieve volume and, and you might get tired singing or, or speaking for a while. Um, Laurel, I think we have the, uh, uh, for one more question and then we'll okay. have to wrap it up. Uh, it's so hard guys, I'm gonna call on Nancy Lee. She's had her hand up for so long. So Nancy, are you still there with your hand up? She might be unmuting herself. Nancy Lee. <laughs> Well, well, um, I think, um, I think, I think.
All right, we're gonna have to move on, Nancy, to the next person. Henriette, are you still there with your hand up? Yes. Okay, go ahead. I'm here. Hi, thank you for letting me join. I'm actually on call from Norway. Um, so it's a bit kind of, I, I got in the middle of things, so I missed the first part of the half of it because uh, the Facebook invite said that it was 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And then in the, in the email, it said uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. But um, I was listening in and then, um, sorry about this, I just need to check what I was thinking about because uh, there were two things that I wondered about. Um, the one thing is all of these extra things like eyes and, and lungs and ears and things um, because according, at least I had this conversation with my neurologist here and because my CMT is CMT1A and it's directly reflecting in the peripheral nerves and doesn't have all of the extra kind of things that they say comes with the CMT4 amongst under, then um, I was wondering about this because all of these other autonomous things like lungs, ears and eyes are all um, shouldn't directly be linked to the PMP22 um, that causes CMT1. So I was wondering if you guys have uh, references to the research that backs up the fact that because I have all of these things that Bethany and, and um, I'm sorry I forgot his name um, the other one was saying about uh, hard of hearing and uh, when people are talking or you know the the lungs not really functioning at night and and also on top of this I have real issues with dry eyes mm. Um, so if there are, there, if there is any um, research, it would be really great if I could have it because that is something, or if you could publish it in some way so that we have the links to it. Um, and then also the other one that I was wondering about, which is also a, a research kind of uh, connected thing, and, and that is, you were talking about male versus female and, you know, people experiencing that only the females are only the males, because here they are talking about, um, and this is not from a family perspective, it's like a, a research perspective. They say that CMTX is supposed to be only transferred between males. But then I have a friend, a female friend, who's been diagnosed with CMTX. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if the research or the, the kind of the it only appearing in males is wrong or whether she has been misdiagnosed. Yeah, I, I can address I to that. I try yeah, to address that. those fairly rapid fire because you asked a ton of really amazing, complicated questions. Um, so CMTX can be passed on, or let me rephrase, because it's <laughs> women and men can have CMT type X. If a woman has CMT type X, she can pass it on to her sons and her daughters. If a man has CMT type X, he can only pass it on to his daughters, and he cannot pass it on to any of his sons. Um. Because if he's having a son, he's passed on his Y chromosome, which is healthy, right? Um, I think a lot of people tend to say that women don't get CMT type X because women tend to be more mildly affected by CMT type X. Very good point. Because women have two X chromosomes, so they almost have like another one that's helping to make up for the weak one. <laughs> Whereas men only have one, so if their CM or if their X chromosome is affected, then it it tends to wreak a little bit more havoc. Hmm. And then as for the other questions, uh, I have not heard from any of my neurologists or any literature that CMT affects the eyes. I think that would be interesting to research, but I don't know of anything for that. So one. there are types that affect that they have oh. optic neuro neuropathy. But it's very rare. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, and so I actually was in touch with Dr. Shai, but it's very rare, Bethany. It was their son who had opt in. Out of the people with this certain type of CMT, only a certain percentage have optic neuropathy. It's rare. It happens. It's rare. Yeah, right? for, right. and for the lungs, the issue isn't the lungs, right? I, right. Was, I was born with good, healthy lungs. 
I would sort of compare it to the nerve muscle issue, right? We're born with great functioning muscles. It's there's an issue upstream with the nerves. And then that leads to sad little muscles. Um, the lung issues happen because you've got that nerve involvement to the diaphragm, right? The phrenic nerve, other nerves involved in like the musculature of your diaphragm that then can lead to lung issues. Um, if I'm not able to take a deep breath and ventilate my lungs, my lungs lose capacity, right? It's not the lungs fault. It's those diaphragmic nerves. Um, and there are a couple really good articles, I believe, on the CMTA's website about that, um, which I think would be a really good place to start. Um, and that's cmtausa.org. And there's also um, a good article about hearing on that website as well. Yes. Um, and about the cochlear nerve. Co cochlear, know. you know what I mean. The, the hearing <laughs> nerve. That nerve. Yes, that, that one. one. I think I have my audio fixed. Oh, good, Nancy. Yes, Nancy Lee. Go, I, I, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll make this super quick. Okay. Uh, my son is 28. He was diagnosed at age 16 with CMT1A, but the diagnosis showed a conduction block, which led the neurologist to think he might have CIPD, uh, inflammatory condition, along with the CMT1A. Um, he has severe pain. Uh, the regular medications do not help him. Does anybody have suggestion on pain management, number one? And second, I cannot understand how a spinal cord stimulator would help someone who already has damaged nerves. But the neurologist seems to think it may be a last resort for him. He has had trouble with addiction, with opioid medications from age 17 to 19. He's clean now but severely depressed, quality of life is shot, um, really, really upset about his condition and worsens uh, almost yearly. So anybody, some quick advice. Let's start. Elizabeth, do you wanna share the, the question we put out for Nancy? Yeah, so, you know, pain management's a tough one. Oftentimes opioids don't work very well on nerve pain. Um, you know, in, in the best world possible. It's a multidisciplinary approach with physical therapy, exercise, hypnotherapy, uh, biofeedback, pain management medications. So as someone who suffers from or who has, uh, who has chronic pain, I know that a pill is not going to be a quick fix. It may help somewhat, but it's not going to be the ultimate cure to your pain. So there are different things. And I would really I don't know if he's worked with somebody that in a multidisciplinary pain clinic, but that's the first thing I would, I personally believe in because I've gone through that route and through the medication routes and have gone off all those medications and then went to pain management. And it's tough. It's a very tough thing because your mind is uh, attached to your body and affects your body. And when you're anxious and stressed or depressed, your pain will be worse. And it's not that it's a psychological problem, it's just the way it works. And pain, living in chronic pain is very depressing. It's very hard. The other, the spinal cord stimulator, I don't know exactly how that works. And I will get back to you. I will ask a neurologist. I did ask the question on our Facebook discussion group to find other people who have had spinal cord stimulators or pain pumps in their spinal column. And um, to, to varying degrees of success, I haven't looked this morning to see what the other answers are, but I'd be happy to speak with you on, offline um, about the pain management question. Okay, that would be great. Um, okay. I don't know how we can do that. Do I? Do oh, I can... uh, Laurel knows me. I can okay. do that. So, Nancy, I'll connect um, you and Elizabeth offline and, and you guys can chat further. Okay. okay. All right. All right. That's I want to thank everybody. Bethany, thank you for your wonderful insight as someone living with CMT. Kenny, thank you for um, coming in and uh, giving your insight also. Somebody here asked what that acronym was that you said. Uh, for, you said, uh, it was something about BiPAP with AD. 
ABAPS, A V A P S. A V A P S. Yep. And so. that stands for Average Volume Assured Pressure Support. Okay. Thank Laurel, you. you're awesome. Thank you so much for being on these calls. She is so great. I just love working with Laurel. And I want to thank every single one of you for being on this Zoom call today. I hope, hopefully, it was helpful. And if you have any questions, please send them to laurel at cmtausa.org. We will get back. And if we don't know the answers, we have a whole uh, research team that we can ask. And thank you, Bethany, and keep up, you know, keep up, keep it up and moving forward. I know it's tough during this COVID time for a lot of us and especially for you. And um, I just love you. Oh, I love you too. And, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure and uh, you know, we're, we're in this together. <laughs> we are. It's a family. So thank you for attending. Thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody as well. Thank you guys for holding this call. It's really oh, informative you. and so helpful. We have a family of four with CMT1A, so it's really thank helpful. You. We'll do it again for sure. Take and care. Please Thanks. Reach out. Everyone has my email, so reach out if you have any questions that we missed in the chat box. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Keep the faith. Bye. -bye. Keep the faith. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.